good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here. Thanks for coming over and spending your night with us. It's a real pleasure to have all of you here, and hopefully you will have a, a very informative session tonight. So I'm Dr. Vachi, and um, uh, we're going to start talking about the knee. So I'll, I'll give a brief introduction about the knee joint. Uh, I'll take uh, probably 10, 15 minutes of your time. Then uh, my partner, Dr. White, will take over and continue the conversation. So we're going to talk about today about the knee. So as you know, uh, the knee uh, is uh, one of the main joints. Uh, it uh, composed of the femur, tibia, and kneecap, what we call patella. It has articular cartilage, which is supposed to be white, shiny, and smooth to allow smooth, pain-free movements. Uh, it also has uh, ligaments, which stabilizes the knee, and ligaments uh, are aligned on both sides of the knee, as well as inside the knee. And also, in between two bones, we have meniscus here. Probably you have heard a lot about the meniscus and meniscal injury. So these are the structures which are the most important in the knee. Bones, femur, tibia, and the kneecap, articular cartilage, which is supposed to be shiny and soft and smooth to allow for movements, and ligaments, which are outside and inside the knee, and plus meniscus, which, which lies there in between two bones and serves as a cushion. Uh, so this is the front view, and this is the side view of the knee. Again, you can see the same bony structures, kneecaps, meniscus is here in between two bones, and the ligament stabilizing the knee. So the entire, uh, entire pathology of the knee, entire problems of the knee, we can divide into three, three big groups. Trauma of the knee, deformity of the knee, and wear and tear of the knee. So wear and tear is, of course, the biggest one. And uh, wear and tear is something which we're going to talk at the end. And my senior partner, Dr. White, is going to talk a, a lot about wear and tear and how we manage the wear and tear. I'm going to talk about these first two items. So trauma of the knee. Uh, when we put aside the fractures, we have some other small type of traumas of the knee which are specific for the knee only. These are meniscal injury, like it's here on this picture, and injuries of the ligaments, like anterior cruciate ligament injury. So this type of um, injuries uh, usually happen in younger population, and they require arthroscopic surgery to repair this. Deformity is a bow legs and knock knees. This is, again, something which is happening uh, in younger adults, and with the age, the amount or the occurrence of deformity increases, and is, this predisposes to wear and tear, which is uh, really a big problem, and especially with uh, age above 50, 55, uh, cartilage is getting worn off, uh, and in the joint we have bone spurs, loss of articular cartilage, joint space narrowing, and this is causing what we call osteoarthritis or wear and tear injury of the knee. So these, all, these, these are the three main categories of the knee, knee, knee issues which we are dealing with. Uh, so with knee trauma, there is a special surgery, keyhole surgery, very minimally invasive surgery, which we call knee arthroscopy. Uh, it looks like this. Uh, this is the knee, uh, small instruments going on inside the knee joint. and. Uh, one of the instruments is camera. Camera is always there to visualize the structure inside the knee. And the other instrument can be a scissor or a special suture or a probe or a shaver when we can uh, either repair the meniscal injury or ligaments injury or clean up the joint and um, repair all the trauma. So here how it looks inside. So this is pretty healthy knee. You see that this is the femoral cartilage, this is the tibia, this is the meniscus. It's all white, smooth, and this is like pretty, pretty healthy knee, pretty healthy appearance of the arthroscopy. So deformity, it's something, again, uh, when I say deformity, I mean knocked knees or bow legs. This is something which happens um, in more younger, uh, uh, younger age like this young uh, woman with uh, 12 degrees of knock knee deformity, and this is her correction. So 
uh, what we do during this correction, we just, I I'm just going to put it simple, although it sounds horrible, we just break the bone, put it in the correct position, and fix the bone. However, it requires lots of, yeah, it's as simple as that, break but, the femur. yes, uh, however, it requires lots of calculation, lots of science, lots of, lots of planning involved. Like, we have special software which allow us to do precise calculation, like in this case, 12 degrees of correction, and um, first perform the surgery on the x-ray, again, with the so special software, and again, uh, uh, get these great results. So, or another case, you can see the prior surgery, the noctin deformity after the surgery in the x-rays, you can see red lines indicate how curved the legs were, the pelvic, see the pelvic was oblique, the pelvis was tilted, now it's straight, and the spine is straight also. Or another girl, you can see again, a bow leg deformity, a special device here on her leg, and the legs are straight, and even we made her some taller. We, we pulled the legs a, a little bit, like we, we lengthened her a couple of inches to make her taller. So this is also possible with correction and with lengthening. And you can see another patient, again, with severe bow leg deformity, again, with lots of planning, lots of calculation, special devices. And here you can see after surgeries, after uh, how it's aligned. So this is deformity part. Uh, when you do deformed, when we do deformity part, we avoid wear and tear. When deformity persists, at the end, we have uh, wear and tear. <coughs> And this is uh, another patient, uh, a dwarf. Uh, here we corrected his, his knees and make him taller. Uh, with kids, when the child is uh, uh, growing, we have another possibility to correct the knock knee deformities with small surgery, like we put a braces, like braces for the teeth. And teeth with growth, they get straighter. And here, with the kids, we have a possibility to correct these noctin deformities with small surgery, with the small plates without major, major uh, intervention. And here you can see the noctin deformity here on the x-ray, and here it's straight. Uh, this is pretty much what, I'm, what I have to say. Uh, the next category of the patients is wear and tear. And Dr. White is going to take over from here and talk, take, talk about wear and tear injuries and then as well as how we manage wear and tear injuries and what we do when uh, the knee is already damaged. So you got just a little glimpse of what actually is a very sophisticated, you know, Vachi, very humble. That's what you would see at Mass General you know, maybe Mayo Clinic, you know, there are very few, you know, in the country who do that. So uh, very, very different and uh, very blessed to have him here at Monadnock. And uh, as he may, you may have heard him in the back, he's, he's trained pediatrics as well as some very serious trauma at level one trauma centers overseas, as well as, you know, spine. He's starting a spine program here. You know, the deformity, we may not see as much of that here, but hopefully, some of that in the future, which things that we just simply haven't had the capacity to do here. Thank you. So do we know where to jump to this one, Vach? So I know they printed out uh, in front of you about your knees. This is, I was just showing, this is a a great site. It's our academy website, so orthoinfo.org. And there are probably at least a dozen different just on the knee, knee arthritis, animated for surgery. You know, so it's got tons of info of non-operative management. So whether you think of anything from anti-inflammatories to bracing, deformity correction, injections, you know, and a ton of you know, well-vetted info. But if you just go to orthoinfo, and I think on your sheet you'll see the, some of the website because that's printed off of there. So for me, when I think about, you know, a knee, any joint, you know, it is not just, you know, it's very different for, you know, the farmer, from the teacher, from the athlete, from the logger. So, you know, we may say, you know, knee arthritis, you know, 
fortuitous tomorrow I'm doing four knees and it's a whole potpourri. The first one is a type of total knee we'll see. It's a called press fit. He's a younger patient, tore his ACL a few decades ago, now needs a knee replacement so we put it in without cement. The next patient has a partial bow-legged deformity we call varus and she's worn out just on the inside so she'll hopefully do a partial knee. My last decision always is made at surgery. We always have kind of plan A, plan B. And then the second two are the arthroscopic version. You know, both a younger patient as well as one who's trying to avoid knee replacement. And he's like not ready, but he knows one more scope to try to get him over into the seventh decade of life. So you might recognize that triangle you know, is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Supposedly Maslow, I don't know if it's big enough for you to see, there's a quote, we, they said, I suppose it's tempting if the only tool you have is a hammer to treat everything as if it were a nail. So frequently orthopedic surgeons are stereotyped in that regard, but it, it goes both ways. We, we have a few non-operative uh, colleagues in our office. They're physiatrists or PM&R, physical medicine and rehab, and their hammer is all the non-operative stuff. So they can do everything from injections to rehab to bracing, even a type of nerve ablation therapy for people who the just nerve endings are you know, too inflamed, too uncomfortable. And often you know, it's Dr. McNamara who does those and I'll ask him who's appropriate for that and it's patients who are too young, too old, too unhealthy. You know, they're, they're just, they're not there either medically or physically, they say, no, I'll never do a knee replacement. And so they have those options, including what things that you know, Vachi and I don't do, but it's in Dr. Harrington and McNamara's repertoire. When we trained, at least here in the States, there were, you might have heard of a book called The House of God back in the late 80s. I think it came out of Mass General or Beth Israel. But there were quotes, never let the skin come between you and the diagnosis. Patients, nothing heals like cold steel. But what I tell patients is there is nothing that cannot be made worse by surgery. And whether you see, you've seen probably the ads recently, the carpal tunnel, you know, now I'm doing carpal tunnel through a little three millimeter incision, but whether it's that or something big like a knee hip replacement, you know, that is the reality. And you know, patients will laugh, but I say, no, I'm 30 years, I've never seen an infection with a carpal tunnel in my practice. But I remember seeing them back when I trained in Boston and the infection coming up the arm, the entire arm having to be opened and treated. So we don't take it lightly. And so whether it's Vachi or Dr. Michael Ack or myself, you know, when we're talking with patients, you'll hear a little bit more about what we call shared decision making because you know, you may have more of a risk of infection or you may have more of blood clot. And so all that factors into you know, our decision is you know, what is right for you. It's not the old system. I had one of my mentors was a Korean surgeon, you know, and he was very much the old patriarchal, you know, you know Don, you need a knee. You're doing a knee. Sign up with Mary. We'll see you in the OR. <laughs> that was it. You know, no discussion. You know, patient, you know. You didn't care what the patient wanted, that's what he needed. So some of you may know, what I, what one of my passions is overseas missions. So I go to Peru regularly, and these are a few examples of probably surgery that shouldn't have been done, you know, and had untoward results. We met this woman, this is a big incision in her arm, she would lift it and it would bend at 90 degrees. When you looked at her, if you can see these, these, these are plates and screws that are just floating free in her arm. So ill-advised surgery, kind of wrong equipment, wrong approach. Where we go out in the jungle, they don't have orthopedic surgeons. They, they're basically general surgeons to do trauma of some sort. And basically they, you know, they do with what they have, which is sometimes no better than running down to bell tapes, grab a couple of screws and a bar and some cement. And surprisingly, they get away with it a lot. But this was a gentleman, he was a subsistence farmer traveled 24 hours by dugout canoe. That's his knee there. This is a deformity, somewhat like Vachi's show, but in this case, he would be bow-legged, not bowed at the knee, because this never healed. 
So he required a big surgery to put plates and screws, bone graft from his hip. So this was one you know, that should have been fixed. They did it without any sort of hardware and it just simply wouldn't heal. So when we look, you know, what we see here and down there, there's terrible arthritis. I mean, they all, Peruvians are about, you know, five, four at tallest where we go, but incredibly bow-legged or varus. They, you know, they could definitely use Vachi's skills and ab the ability to realign them because all of their wear is what we, in the inside is what we call medial or varus arthritis. So that's, I do a lot of uni or partial replacement knees. And I talk to our reps, it probably it turns out I do more partials than anybody in New England. So when I trained, I went through a New England Medical Center, New England Baptist, six years of orthopedics, I probably saw three or four partial knee replacements total. It was very different. You only did it in the 80 plus year old, very low demand, now with the technology they have, and particularly the one I use, it's called the Oxford knee out of Oxford, England. They now have 40 years of experience and the results and longevity are as good or better than the total knees. One of the problems with the, the total when we replace all three parts of the joint that uh, Vachi showed is roughly 20% of patients are not happy with a total knee. It can look perfect, but they aren't happy and we, and we don't know. There's a new trend towards something called kinematic knees. And so there, we're always trying to tweak that edge and find out why is it? There's some patient personality, some who are you know, poorer with pain or what we call catastrophizers. So there are certain things that's part of, back to that Voltaire and the, the art of medicine. So here's a, a classic one, very similar to what I'm gonna do tomorrow morning. This gentleman tore his ACL about 30 years ago. His knee wore out completely. As you can see, it's, it's shifted basically almost a half an inch to the side. He's beyond the point where we can think about a partial knee replacement. So he had a total knee. This is one done without cement, what we call a press fit. And this is actually what my first case tomorrow is the same thing. A late 50s gentleman, very active. ACL reconstruction 30 years ago. Now his knee is worn out, and so we'll do a total. The partial, and, and this is, if, if you can see it, when you come to the office, these are up in all of my room, and it kind of shows the normal, very smooth articular cartilage. They say, if you imagine you pop open the chicken wing, it's smoother than ice on ice. It's an almost frictionless system. But then as Vachi showed, it breaks down, you lose that, it's rough, you know, you hear the grinding, popping, swelling, it all depends on the, the person. And these pictures kind of show some patients wear out only under their kneecap. It's about 1% of the population. Some wear out just on the inside. And that's by far 90% of the partials I do are the people who wear out, either they're going slightly bow-legged and then there's a population that wears out, they go knock knee, that's far more likely to be female than male in that case. And that's probably 5% or less of the partials. And then there are those that wear out in multiple compartments and end up with a total knee replacement. But these are, this is just an example of the Oxford. And you can see even at the, that says 20 years survivorship, 91%, 94 at 15. Patients always like, Am I just going to need a, a total knee? I've been doing partials at least 15 years, and I've had to redo two of them. Both were women, both women BMI well over 40. You know, probably would have done it in a slightly different way, but both of them, one lasted 12 years, one lasted 14, even in a probably not the ideal candidate situation. So, so Yeah, that, like you see there, like I'll tell the total knee patients, if you look at them 20 years later, it's a, somewhere in that 88 to 90% are still in and working 20 years later. Now, obviously, it's different if you have the you know, 45 year old, 280 pound construction worker versus 120 pound, 75 year old woman, you know, they're not apples and apples. 
but over, overall, barring you know, infections, other complications, you know, there's not a big difference in longevity. Mary Liz, I see you. Oh, I'm 20 years. I have good ID. I'm 20 years. <laughs> and my other name is, well, it is 19 and a half. And my other name is 20 years ago. Hanging in there. <laughs> yeah, and that is the, 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 the whole team across, absolutely. So this is an example of an of a MRI scan looking at the knee, the, the black or some of the ligaments that Vatu showed on the anatomic picture. This is you know, what is called anteromedial arthritis, meaning on the inside and toward the front of the knee. The normal bone marrow is this darker coloration where it's white. The meniscus here has been pushed out, is basically extruded, like pushing toothpaste out of the tube. So it, on the outside, the meniscus is between the bones. It's still cushioning. This is the ACL here, which has to be intact for me to do a partial. If the ACL is gone, you're not a candidate. And then you could see it's just totally overloaded. And so these patients we do in the office, we do an x-ray where you press on a pillow. And prior to this view, it would be bone on bone. You stress it, you see that it opens on the inside and the outside remains intact. So that's one of the few markers in tests that I do to say, are you a candidate for a partial? Do we have to think towards total? Uh, what are your options? And this is the same. This is from the side. There's, for the Oxford, there's the one on the outside. This bearing doesn't move. For the one on the inside, it's a little difficult to see from here. But as the knee moves, you've only replaced here. But the white is the bearing. And in this knee, it goes back and forth. On the outside, the way the knee works, there's too much motion. And so this is, it looks similar. But that white piece is, is hooked to the metal piece on the tibia, the leg, because there's too much mobility and it would pop out. So they may look the same, you know, very similar, but there's some subtle you know, biomechanical differences. And that's what it looks like when you just replace the medial or the lateral side. And these are just other MRI examples uh, honing in. This one may look similar with the white of the bone and the meniscus, but the outer side is also showing changes. The meniscus isn't working normally, and I would push the patient towards a total versus a partial in that situation. These are just, again, additional MRI pictures. We do, we have basically a type of computer software, do sort of CAD CAM planning. What are the appropriate sizes? What do the angles look like? Where, and then when, something like what Vachi does with the limb correction, much more sophisticated software to look at all of this. But this is an example you can imagine. Rather, when you do the, the total knee, you get that you know, big piece of metal like somebody in the back row has there, plus the kneecap. When you do the, the partial, that's all. You take in that area that's overloaded, bone on bone. And so you're not attacking the kneecap part of the joint. You're not attacking laterally. So it's a much lesser procedure, it's faster recovery, it's less or fewer complications overall. When I first started, you know, because it was so different than how I was trained, is how are patients gonna do? Well, I think they do better. And I, I tell patients, I make I'm no bones about it, I've been drinking the Kool-Aid for probably 15 years now. You, you don't take the ACL, and again, you has to be present to do the, so by not removing ligaments, it's, patients say it feels more natural. So I have lots of guys who hunt, who ski, who hike the mountain, and they get better sensory feedback. I tell most patients, you, know, you do a knee replacement, it's not 100% pain relief. You do hips. I mean, I did, I was talking earlier, I did two 300-pound males you know, on Monday. I could barely move my arm by Monday night trying to wrestle, it's not a gentle operation, but it's a ball and socket. I mean, they go home the same day, they're walking, in a few days, often off, off their walker crutches, 
knees, even the partials hurt for longer. But the, no doubt, on average, the partials are much less uncomfortable and can get back to the hunting, side hills, all that sort of activity, hiking up and down Monadnock. This is a gentleman, uh, mid-50s, runs a construction firm, both knees, worn out on the center. He's a big boy, very muscular, probably 260, 270. Did the x-rays and said, okay, he does open, the outside seems good. And so these are all pictures actually that I grabbed from patients I saw this last week. I just went through my list and say, okay, who have I seen? And just the variety. So he was here for his one year follow-up. So both knees, both of them did internally. He's a year out. Again, had to have a normal cruciate ligament and he's doing everything he wants to from a, a work and activity standpoint. This was another guy I just saw, 70 years old. So this is his left knee, and this is his right from behind. If any of you have been to the office and Amy or one of our techs has taken x-rays, you'll, they'll have done some with you standing, slightly bent. So his left looks worse than his right. He has no pain over here. So that's why I say all real estate is local. You know, yes, that looks worse, but this is his problem knee. And I see it every day in the office. The left hip looks bad, the right one hurts. And so, you know, I don't go, the x-ray is a blueprint, it's a template, it's one piece of information, but that's not what determines. He's still, a year later, after surgery here, doing fine over there. He, he refs college soccer. I just saw him for his one year. Last year he refed 63 games, about three per week, at the high school and college level on his partial knee. So these just again looks at some of the, this is more for the, the lateral side, but at 15 years and 20 years, you know, over 90% are still in and working just fine. More recently, I've added in the last couple of years, I was a little reluctant to do what's called the patellofemoral. But as I said, about 1% of people wear out primarily under their kneecap, women more than men. And so they classically, you know, with the bow-legged kind, you'll say, where does it hurt? And they can be very specific. With kneecap arthritis, patients go here. I say point with one finger and they grasp the whole front of the knee. It's like a band. They have problems. You can't get up from kneeling. If they can kneel, stairs, squatting, any bent knee, activity. They might be fine walking, but try to bend and that's their problem area. So there has been, you know, a lot of evolution in the patellofemoral replacement. So this was somebody I did recently standing, her knees look perfect between the femur and the tibia, no evidence of arthritis, good joint spaces. And in another case, it looked that way on x-ray, it was just the kneecap. But as I said, plan B, when I got in, the inside of the knee here had extensive wear, and I thought it was too much just to do the partial. So most patients, I'll tell them, 95% uh, chance we can do a partial, or uh, I think we're pushing it 50-50 or 70%. And she suspected it, and it was one that instead she had pretty soft bone, so we ended up doing a, a toe, whoop, a total knee replacement. So this is an example when you take an extra called the sunrise, look it's under the kneecap, and you can see yeah, there's good space here, but there's none. This is taken with her bent 30 degrees. So it's classic, we call patellofemoral arthritis or arthrosis. And then we do that, again, the software, we look, this is templating if I can do a partial, it might look to be that size. If I have to do a total, that's what that describes. And it may be hard to see from here, but this good space here, but bone on bone under her kneecap. And fortunately, looking in, we were able to do a partial in her situation. And that's what it looks like, that where you saw it bone on bone before. Kneecap stays in the center. This is not empty. That's a you know, plastic kneecap. Same thing we have with a total knee. 
and it's used with this partial, but the rest of the knee is preserved, so all the ligaments internally are the same. This, and these are results that they show for the partial you know, kneecap or patellofemoral. Again, 84% in a bunch of different studies, 90%, 96%. So very comfortable as far as doing the partial versus the total, especially that you know, you know, a certain percentage of totals just aren't happy. And again, we still don't know precisely why. Here's an example. This was one, uh, I think this was one I talked about earlier. Thought we could do a partial knee, but internally more changes, and so did the total knee replacement. So we mentioned earlier about what we call shared decision-making, kind of what is right for you may not be right for your neighbor here at the table, friend, spouse, coworker, and what is right for you today may not be right for you next month, next year. I do tell many patients the reality is you're not getting younger, you're probably not getting healthier. You know, and when I trained, we tried to get people to 65 or there was some magic age. Now, I, I rarely do that. The technology, the longevity with our newer replacements is good enough that there's really no benefit to wait a year, to wait three years, five years. And so once we call it, we call it medical optimization, basically is you, once you're quote, tuned up medically, whether it's heart, lung, liver, you know, psyche, whatever it has to be, you know, then if, if it's right for you, you know, we proceed. Uh, last week, the two big boys, one was a 39 year old hip replacement, had had trauma as a young man, a motorcycle accident uh, or construction, one of the two, but you know, he was 39, but his hip was a mess and you know, it, it didn't matter at his age. The other was 75, but he's still active, wants to do, I did his other hip almost 20 years ago, but then this one finally caught up. So as opposed to my old Korean mentor, you know, yes, you know, you ask your surgeon for advice, you talk with them, but in the reality is the decision is yours. And I always say, just remember, there's nothing that can't be made worse by surgery. So this little guy is another one that I met down in Peru. Name is Santiago. It's hard to see, but he's got multiple incisions. That's his leg at 90 degrees and flopping. He had been in an accident, and I'm sure Vachi never would have operated at that age. You can cast almost anything, and it'll heal. But for some reason, they put big plates and screws in there. Twice, it failed. But we took care of him, and... There he is with my daughter. His name's Santiago, and he comes back, and uh, for those of you who followed World Cup, he says, now I run like Messi. <laughs> yeah. So he's Peruvian, but he's an Argentinian fan, so. All right. 